It's uh, such a perfect material, perfect carbon, natural carbon form. Allotrope is a form of carbon that it um, that you inject it into a broken spinal cord, and the signals in the spinal cord are conveyed so accurately that that the cord refuses. George, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be here in Salt Lake City. Yeah. I'm really excited for the conversation. So you've written a number of books. Uh, you're an award-winning author and speaker. Uh, you are a techno- technological visionary, uh, and you are... You challenge traditional economics. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we move on? I was a co-founder of the Discovery Institute in Seattle, which uh, uh, actually is runs a COSM conference every year. Oh, nice. Um, and I've run this COSM conference with Discovery off and on for 50 years now. And it brings together a whole bunch of technology um, visionaries, people like Bob Metcalf, who invented yeah. Ethernet, yeah. Uh, Carver Mead, who is really the at the heart of uh, the physics of computation and the physics of of uh, large scale integrated circuits that are, that are the basis of all our electronics and uh, he's a great man 90 years old now yeah. and we're going to be celebrating him he and um uh, but peter teal uh, opens our conference every year recently and uh, we've had eric schmidt of google and and lots of venture capitalists yeah. attend it so that's cosm and that's uh, in Seattle on uh, November, I mean, uh, October 30th to November 1st. And, okay. and, it's, um, and we'll be introducing a new paradigm in electronics beyond NVIDIA, believe it or not. Yeah. Every, NVIDIA is now at its triumphant moment. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I uh, regard the current electronic model or paradigm that that's the current um, logic of of our electronic industry is resembling the IBM mainframe era that prevailed when I was coming up yeah. and it was believed that a few hundred first tens and then a few hundred of uh, IBM mainframe computers, giant computers and on shrines and of um, and kind of cathedrals of computation. There would only be a few hundred of those in the world, and they would satisfy the world's need for computation. And today we have these giant data centers yeah. and the, uh, only a few hundred giant data centers can do all the computing for the universe. It's e- often uh, implied. And, uh, and I think this is the same kind of illusion that afflicted uh, uh, Thomas J. Watson and the original IBM visionaries of the past. Hmm. And, and that um, we're going to have supercomputers in all our pockets or in our ears, and uh, we're we're uh, um, you know this idea that computation is some gigantic singularity yeah. is uh, a delusion. Hmm. It's there's not one answer to everything. There are as many answers as there are human minds hmm. in the on the planet and uh and each of the human minds is as densely connected as the entire internet yeah there's many connections in each human mind 
And each human mind runs on 12 to 14 watts mm. of energy, while the global internet takes terawatts shortly. Uh, that's trillions of watts. And it's it just um, human minds are still supreme. And uh, the so we're I think we're going to move on to a new uh, paradigm and computation hmm. beyond the data center yeah. and beyond NVIDIA's massively parallel graphics processing chips translated to token and parameter processing chips of artificial intelligence. How is it that, I mean, throughout your life, you've been ahead of the game, like ahead of the ball when it comes to predicting what's going to happen with technology. What, what is it about you and how you operate that allows you to see things before they happen? I think I'm a generalist. Hmm. You know, um, each technology develops its own um, categories of specialization. Yeah. And uh, the specialists are confined by the assumptions and, and goals and uh, constraints of their particular specialty. Yeah. And I've I've been I've always been a generalist. I I uh, I just operate uh, farther farther up the ladder of abstraction than uh, most of the people who are who work in uh, uh, technology. Yeah, Th that's interesting. I'm a generalist. I would consider myself a generalist. I have a lot of interests. Uh, I'm not like a specialist where I have one thing. I've always kind of envied people who can just dive into one thing their entire lives. I know a lot of other generalists too. So do you have any advice for generalists uh, on how to approach life be, and be succeed? Con be confident mm. that that your, your layer is real, yeah. but that the specialists also possess real insights that are relevant to their specialty. Mm. And, and what you got to understand is how the general conditions of, of technology are reflected in the special uh, conditions of any particular uh, application or any particular... Mm. Um, and... And, you know, the people in artificial intelligence today all kind of imagine that they're gods. Yeah. You know, it, it's really, uh, they almost, they uh, imagine that they've created mind and that this mind actually has the potential to reproduce itself across the universe and, 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 uh, I think this is a, a great delusion in computer science at the moment, which I first encountered way back in 1947 or 48 when uh, McCarthy, who was a Stanford University professor at the Dartmouth Conference, mm -hmm. famous, yeah. that where they, uh, this was back in the IBM mainframe era, yeah. And they all got together, all these leading figures in computer science back in 19, late 1940s after the Second World War, and they uh, concluded solemnly in their conference that uh, in a few weeks in the summer, it would be possible to contrive computers that way excelled all human capabilities, that this general artificial intelligence that that's still the holy grail of uh, computer science was could be achieved in a few weeks in the summer after they uh i think the conference was in may and after they uh um uh, dispersed they'd uh they could do it mm. and uh th that was uh 80 years ago now or 70 Two years ago, and and I don't think we're 
a lot closer than we were back in uh, in uh, 1948. I mean, it's the yeah. the same kind of illusion that the brain is a machine that can be modeled really mechanistically, and uh, that it uh, uh, can be reproduced and and is ultimately deterministic. This is one of the real illusions that afflicts almost all the dominant fields is that is that uh, the world is deterministic yeah that that if that uh, the same factors will produce the same results every time and uh, and that's that's the basic illusion um, and it it's uh we all know in our own lives it's not true, mm. but uh, it's somehow believed to be true at some higher level, and uh, and and it leads to all sorts of misconceptions and and ultimately failures, because the the real tr- tr- truth is ordinarily comes as a surprise to us. Yeah, it's uh, unexpected bits or information of what you can predict is uh, really empty. It's not even information. Uh, information is the unexpected uh, results, which is what um, Claude Shannon, the really the founder of information theory, uh, uh, discovered and. Uh, it's really the basic insight between all and uh, all our communications. The reason we can efficiently send vast bodies of communication across fiber optic lines around the world is that uh, we only have to watch for for the changes, for the unexpected effects, rather than uh, the predictable effects. The um, predictable effects are low entropy they're mm. they're the electromagnetic spectrum that bears the signal but the actual signal is the distortions mm. uh that uh are not expected and are not predictable and it, but it takes a predictable carrier a predictable structure of some sort to bear unexpected information if 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 like the money supply today it's um all unpredictable Hmm. it can't really bear very much information gotcha when it you said that it's kind of delusional to believe that obviously the the people running ai companies are gods but uh do you think that recently with the rise of LLMs being uh, more prominent and more LLMs capable- LLMs are large language models. Yeah, do you, do you believe that that is confusing people to believe it's more intelligent than it is? Because we're, before this, we were the only species to use language to, in that kind of way, like to a great degree. I know other animals, there's a few other animals that can use it um, at a more basic level, but- we're the species that yeah, uses yeah. language. And now we, you know, we've been able to work with computers our whole lives or not yeah. our whole lives, but for decades, yeah. we've been able to use computers, but we've never been able to speak with computers in our native language yeah, yeah. and be able to actually get language back to us, our native yeah, language yeah. back. Do you feel like that's confusing people into believing that we're dealing with something more intelligent than it actually is? Absolutely. Hmm. I mean, that's what's what's happening is we uh, interpret a reproduction of a, of a giant map hmm. of all the previous relationships between various words and and how frequently they appear together, and that these are the weights of the map of the data space that generates language yeah. and it's, it's just finding all the ways people use language in the past mm. and uh, 
producing the most likely result in response to the question you ask, the query, the yeah. prompt. And, and it, uh, it's mechanistic, it's probabilistic, it's, and, it, uh, and it's not intelligent. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, and, uh, and we are intelligent. We know we are intelligent. Yeah. And, and in the sense that we know consciously that we command something that we can ascribe to intelligence, uh, the data center does not possess. Mm. It does, it, there, I mean, people say it must be conscious or they, or it, when they talk this way, it just means they don't understand what consciousness is, which is perfectly a uh, reasonable confession of ignorance to make. But to say that because they don't understand how a database could get, be conscious, that it means that uh, the database might be conscious. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it just... Hmm. It's amazing how how these these intellectual specialists in the field of computer science have allowed themselves to be deluded hmm. by their own field, and I think it it may have something to do with atheism. You know, you, if there's no ultimate meaning, then any meaning you ascribe may be real. That's one of the, but uh, it's. It's amazing. There's a, a real giant philosophy, philosophy in, um, in Israel named Eli Harari. Mm. I yeah. don't know. He wrote a book called Sapiens and yeah, another, right a whole, whole series of, of, of quite brilliant and yeah. fascinating books that sort of sum up the prevailing knowledge of, of uh, modern agnostic philosophy yeah and and uh, a couple of weeks ago he declared that uh, you know this really might be the end for the human race mm. um, and the three big threats he cited was uh, one was thermonuclear war and that's a real threat that could be serious yeah but then he added climate change and AI hmm. And I may be, I'm I've I'm eighty four years old. I've seen a lot come and go, but I can just tell you if the smartest guy in the world today, some people think Harari is the smartest guy in the world today, if uh, if he believes that climate change and uh, and AI are mortal threats to the human race. He, it, he's just confessing he doesn't know anything. Hmm. He's really confessing. I don't, I don't have a clue. No. I mean, climate has changed throughout history, and it's, the current climates are relatively benign compared to previous climates. It, it, this whole idea that there's some fundamental crisis of climate change is just ridiculous. I mean, you go outside and... It's hot in Salt Lake City in July, as is our usual experience. But there's nothing fundamentally changed about climate. And uh, the C CO2 is diminishing returns and its impact. And, and uh, its impact in the past has been modest. Hmm. And so uh, th that is on climate. So... Uh, it, the fact that Harari, the author of Sapiens and all these um, books that everybody ponders with great seriousness, can believe that climate change is a kind of climactic threat to the race, uh, we wouldn't be here if climate change was. Uh, and and uh, and his second point was that. AI, which is just the computer computer systems, mechanistic computer systems, they they're bigger than they've ever been because they're in these data centers and they can have all the data on the internet and they can uh, give you a image today of what all the how all the previous images were interrelated in the past and what the weights of 
between the tokens uh, were. It, it, in language, it takes all the previous uses of language that are in the database and figures out if one word, how often one word is related to another word mm. in all the past uses of language. And, and, and those averages will turn out to make sense because, uh, because people previously used language in ways that communicated. And so they can reduplicate mm. uh, very accurately previous language uses on average. Yeah. But chat GPT, which is the open AI, uh, Microsoft sort of um, initial big breakthrough in language, large language models. And they, if they actually give their accurate answer, their average answer, nobody wants it. Hmm. It's too boring. Yeah. That's registered zero. They have temperatures of, in uh, chat GPT and zero temperature is just the average right answer from all the databases in, in this particular data center. But people actually, um, if you rank temperatures between zero and one, uh, 0. 0.8 is what they want. Hmm. And that's, and 0. 0.8 means a high level of random number generation. Mm. And and many of the f key figures from Jeffrey Hinton and others in uh, in AI, Ray Kurzweil, and, uh, imagine that randomness and creativity have something to do with each other. Yeah. And really, they're opposites. Hmm. So here, at, uh, and in fact, if something's random, it's it's probably not creative. It's something that just bubbles up from the accidents of the environment, but uh, it create something that's creative is the opposite of something that's random. Hmm. And yet uh, all it's the for Harari, the Kurzweil, who was a friend of mine, a very brilliant guy, invented all kinds of stuff. And Jeffrey Hinton, who was really the leader of Google Brain and DeepMind and all these they actually believe randomness and uh, creativity are essentially the same, or might be, and 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 it's and they're opposites. So if your your basic proposition is to interpret two opposites, two irreconcilable different concepts as the same, if you need to do that to make your worldview makes sense, there's something wrong with your worldview. So creativity and randomness seem to have a link in, in my mind because randomness can lead to creativity, but like you can, you can hit random keys on a keyboard and you can, you can come across something that inspires or sparks some creativity, but I believe you're correct that they're not the same thing. The ram randomness can help you come up with ideas, but the creativity is actually taking that and creating something with it. Would that be pretty accurate in your yeah, mind? Yeah, it's, it, they're just different things. I yeah. mean, if you get, hit, hit random keys in the keyboard, hmm. uh, every now and then there'll be some nice sounds will come yeah. out. But in general, you'll do better uh, following uh, Mozart, yeah, of, or yeah. Uh, or the Beatles. Who got the Beatles on the wall? They yeah. they weren't random. They were creative. Yeah. With AI, you're not at all. I mean, because there, this has been an ongoing conversation. People like Elon Musk and and a lot of uh, big people in the AI world will talk about AI and and discuss some things that they're concerned about. You're not at all concerned about AI creating catastrophic problems as 
humans give AI more control over Well, if, if humans give up control to some mechanistic system that's ultimately based on a random number generator, yeah. that's the end of the human race. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have to, God better take over and intervene again in a real uh, potent yeah. way if, uh, if we deliver up the world to randomness and 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 actually you know that all the outcomes of ai are ultimately determined by the choice of the data mm. that you uh insert in the database and uh, the choices of the data the definitions of the data mm. the definitions of the words in the language the level of abstraction it's all uh, these outcomes that you get yeah. are are really shaped by human minds making decisions, and they may be bad decisions, they may be good decisions, but but ultimately they're based on uh, human minds making decisions, and yeah. and the human mind is, you know, it makes decisions. It's on 12 to 14 watts of energy. The human mind is as densely connected as the entire global internet. Mm. And yet it runs on 12 to 14 watts, and there are 8 billion of them now. Yeah. While uh, the global internet runs... Now verges on trillions of watts, and it it has uh, all the limitations of the data that that shape the answers that it generates. Yeah, I. It's interesting because when you talk about the data and the way that the mind works, it seems to touch on uh, the concept of decentralization a little bit yeah, that, yeah. that you touched on uh, with or that you focused on in Life After Google. Um, so, Life After Google and then Life After Capitalism yeah. and Life After Television <laughs> was my first book of pro prophesying life after some prevailing technology gives way. And uh, Could you maybe explain why you think decentralization is... I mean, I, I agree that decentralization is way better than centralization, but can you give it in your own words, like why you think decentralization is so much superior? Well, it gives a lot more experimental examples, mm. a lot more possible paths uh, for success. I mean, if you have a singularity of, and the singularity is wrong, mm. uh, the whole system crashes. If you have 8 billion singularities out there, and one of them goes bad. You got uh, seven billion nine hundred whatever yeah. uh, other singularities to correct it. And and if you have a free market where the most successful paths or most successful projects prevail over unsuccessful projects, um, you have more chances for successful projects if if the system is decentralized than if it's uh, concentrated in one database, for example, or just a few databases or mm -hmm. Amazon Web Services or Google Mind or the, all these singular notions of, of intelligence really eclipse the, the great bounty of, of having many possible paths, many possible experiments, many outcomes where in a free marketplace, a free environment, the most successful, the most creative, the most inspired uh, prevail. The most uh, aligned with the, uh, the realities of the world and the universe. One of the things I would suspect a lot of proponents of like a centralized kind of structure of, of anything 
are going to advocate or, or suggest could be a problem of any kind of decentralization stru- decentralized structure is like disinformation and being wrong in the information. Like it seems like people that advocate for centralized anything often focus on like if let's say information, if you decentralize information, you are going to have a problem with misinformation, people introducing flawed data in there. Um, Is that a problem in your opinion? Yeah, it's a problem. That's if you have a singularity, if you have, only one information system, then you got to be worried that that false information uh, intrudes into your model. Yeah. Uh, but if you got eight billion people uh, making decisions and uh, and each one conscious in a way that your data center isn't, you have a um, much better prospect of actually arriving at correct conclusions and you and you're more likely to arrive at correct conclusions if you don't arbitrarily uh, define certain paths as uh, definitive and mm-hmm. scientific and and unchallengeable uh, you know that as Harari did I mean Harari thinks that climate change and AI, are the worst things in the world. And I mean, it's, are the most dangerous yeah. things in the world. And it's, it's just, it's, you know, pe- people, they may think that, uh, but uh, he really doesn't have any evidence to, um, to support it. I mean, it's, although his book is, is full of, sophisticated theories and observations he, and and they're interesting to read he knows a lot yeah. but he he knows a lot but he doesn't know what he knows and what he doesn't know so in that respect he rather reflects uh, an AI data center mm-hmm. which also doesn't know what it doesn't know yeah. <laughs> and uh, no it's it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned it earlier with that consciousness thing. Believing AI is consciousness, conscious without being able to define what conscious is. Like if I tell somebody this is a rock, I'm holding a rock, yeah, yeah. and they're like, "Okay, but what is a rock?" And I can't explain what a rock yeah, is. Yeah. Then there's no way for me to actually prove to the person I'm, I'm telling I have a rock that I have a rock. Yeah. So yeah. how can it, it seems nonsensical for people to say? we believe we've created consciousness with AI, even though there's no agreement on what consciousness yeah, is. Like, is. There, I mean, this has been debated for thousands of years, yeah. discussed for thousands of years. Nobody actually can say definitively what consciousness is. Mm. So aside from just being kind of nonsensical to to claim that you can achieve something that you can't define, is there a big risk in that? Like if you're trying to create something that you actually don't know what you're trying to create. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a risk if the whole culture gets completely absorbed in some false AI model. Mm. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of, a, you know, a satanic temptation, I might call it, that you believe that you're God yourself and you've created mind that you've had a great genesis moment Mm. and that uh this moment is so potent that it's actually going to eclipse the previous genesis by creating entities that are so transcend us in capabilities that that they uh leave us behind and um and maybe even uh terminate us and so these all that kind of thinking yeah. is um is kind of i mean if it if it wasn't so stupid uh you might call it satanic and uh yeah. but it it's ultimately stupid in my my view so so you can kind of ignore things that that just are 
are stupid. But here we have our whole politics, uh, the prevailing political model it wants to devote the entire economy to uh, some kind of climate change religion mm. that's epitomized by spreading windmills that are uh, and solar panels all over the landscape that produce zero energy. Mm. That, that uh, they produce they produce some energy, excuse me, but zero power. Mm. Their uh, power is energy that that is uh, con- under control and predictable and. Uh, can uh, drive a machine mm. and uh, and uh, erratic flows of wind or or heat uh, can do none of that. So so they so so and the energy has to be um, transformed into power by gigantic, expensive. A uh, costly battery mm. uh, arrays uh, that actually produce the power because they convert these erratic streams from uh, from uh, wind and sun into into actual power mm. uh, that's usable. But but this means the uh, the wind and Sun is is irrelevant. It, it uh, it's not it's not contributing. It's it's actually just wasting arable land and mm. and uh, and rare earth materials and metals and and it's and maintenance requirements and it, it it's it's just a huge distraction. And and here we have. A government and a political order in the United States, but across Europe, it's wreaked, wreaking havoc in Europe as well. Hmm. That's devoted to this, what I call a, it's a bizarre religion of uh, windmill totem poles and druidical sun hinges, like the stone hinges. Of the past that yield nothing, but uh, on which we waste trillions of dollars, literally trillions of dollars, and then we imagine, then we get our economists on board, and the economists imagine that these trillions of dollars, mostly printed by the Federal Reserve, and devoted to these empty. Uh, Minus sources of energy contribute to GDP. Yeah. You know, every dollar of, of uh, federal government spending is con- is assumed to be worth what it costs. Hmm. And uh, and meanwhile, uh, private sector creativity is vastly undervalued in uh, economic models as as uh, the Yale Nobel laureate. Nordhaus um, has found in his invention of time prices, which are really a great breakthrough in economics that I write about in my life after television, life after <laughs> capitalism, yeah. and which um, uh, Gail Pooley and Marion Tupi have a book called Superabundance, which I wrote the introduction to, mm. which is the was the leading book at Freedom Fest this year, uh, and uh, it got the prize, and uh, and it really shows that most of the economic data that you read and that economists collect and that are are fundamentally wrong. They vastly understate the creativity and the value produced by technology, for mm. example, and vastly overstate the worth of uh, 
trillions of dollars spent on various religious pursuits mm. like uh, windmills and solar panels. And, and that's... Uh, And uh, yet these are the economic data that everybody, conservatives and liberals, debate about, Republicans and Democrats debate about all across the country. Mm. But they're they're just um, phantoms. It's a phantom um, economics that, that should be replaced by the economics I introduce in Life After Capitalism of uh, the information theory of economics, taking the information theory that manifestly functions in computer science and communications theory and and, uh, extending that to economics. Yeah, so you... I, I listened to Life After Capitalism uh, recently, and I I really found that interesting. How you you said capitalism and socialism are both based on this superstition that uh, wealth is summed up with material wealth versus things. Yeah, wealth is material resources. Yeah, and I think we intuitively know that that's not true. Like, I mean. That's why we get uh, those sayings like, you know, money doesn't bring happiness. Mm-hmm. Like we know that and we uh, talk uh, about that as uh, a society, but then we also base our entire economies and our way of living around trying to accumulate wealth in the form of material yeah. substances and material goods. So it is interesting. And then the, uh, the time prices that you introduced are really interesting because you basically break down how many hours would you have to work in the early 1900s to be able to get a certain product versus now, and yeah. basically everything eat. has gone down to considerably. Eat and shelter and yeah. travel and communicate or any of the things we do. Yeah. One of the things I'd like to ask you is, it, it seems I've always been a fan of decentralization, even before I really knew what decentralization was um, as a word. Um, I've always been against censorship and stuff like that. Like control of information has always been really bad, in my opinion. And the risk of misinformation, disinformation, that risk is ultimately overshadowed by the the benefit of having the freedom to go out and pursue information and yeah. have individuals that aren't even specialists or anything like that yeah. come up with new information, new theories, anything like that. It seems like the people who support centralization, at least a portion of those people, ultimately believe that smart people need to be in control of things and they're one of the smart people that need to be in control of things and the smart people that should be in control have gotten into the positions to be in control of things in the proper way. And the people who believe more in decentralization believe in the value of every human being, not necessarily this elite group that should be controlling things. Would you say that's fairly accurate and that's how you operate? I think that's that's a good case for decentralization. I mean, it, yeah. uh, 8 billion sources of, of new ideas yeah. is more valuable than one singularity that is certified by the government and yeah. uh, some body of expertise as correct for, and, uh, enforceable. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, the, the great, illusion really is what I call the materialist superstition. The idea that that wealth is somehow material resources. And uh, Thomas Sowell wrote a book way back in 1970s called uh, Knowledge and Decisions. And in that he points out that the Neanderthal in his cave 
had all the material resources we have today. Mm. The difference between the our age and the Stone Age is entirely the growth of knowledge. Mm. And wealth is really knowledge. And a, a MIT professor wrote a book about uh, information and knowledge. Um, and uh, uh, he, he pointed out uh, you know, a new Tesla car, or I think he may have said Mercedes Benz, I can't remember, but uh, crashes into a wall mm. and all the value disappears, even though every atom and molecule remains. Hmm. The value of the car was information and knowledge. It, it, it wasn't the atoms of material that comprised it. You mentioned, I believe in life after capitalism, that somebody proved that no one person knows how to produce a pencil. Is that correct? In life, and I think that story actually goes way back to my first big bestseller, which was Wealth and Poverty, mm. which was Reagan's favorite, President Reagan's favorite book and really launched my career, wealth and poverty. But um, this was Leonard Reed, who wrote a book on uh, the pencil. Hmm. And, uh, and he showed that, uh, that no single person has the knowledge to build a pencil, that yeah. a pencil is, consists of, you know, mining equipment that extracts the graphite from the ground and the wood of the right composition and cuts the wood and, you know, he, he identifies all the tremendous uh, steps of creativity that were indispensable to manufacturing a single wooden pencil. Yeah. And, and, and no, single human being commands all that knowledge. Mm. Uh, that's why um, the collective vision does have some truth. Uh, it's uh, the, you, you know, th that, that the value we enjoy here, where none, none of this equipment that is conveying our voices across the world could uh, could be could have been contrived by us yeah. I mean it it, it it does and that's the sort of source of the central delusion that somehow um, th that uh, it's some external body produced all this yeah. stuff. And uh, that it's somehow an expression of the randomness evolution of material through the centuries ended up congealing in these um, auditory equipment that uh, and communications gear that um, that uh, comprised the miracle of this conversation yeah. and its propagation around the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really good uh, case for decentralization. Yeah. Like I, if I wanted to start this podcast and I, I had to create everything I needed to, to run the podcast, I'd still be trying to figure out exactly how a camera works or yeah, how yeah. the electronics of a microphone or there'd be so much. And I use a computer for everything. And there's so much that I, and this is every human being, we use so much yeah, that we yeah. don't actually understand the inner workings of. Yeah. And and I don't think there's anybody who would understand the inner workings of everything they use. Like I'm not a mechanical person as far as automobiles. I drive uh, one uh, most uh. days, but I don't know how, I yeah. don't, couldn't rebuild an engine or anything uh, like that. I have to go to a mechanic. And that mechanic probably has to And take, even the mechanic yeah. can't do it. I mean, yeah. it's... it's uh, yeah, uh, there's different parts of a car and they all have to operate together. And yeah, you have to have 
different pieces put together by different people that have yeah. specialized knowledge and and for it to come together. So I think it's a really case, strong case for decentralization yeah. that we we just don't know enough as an individual. And I think anyone running a business or uh, trying to build anything runs into this. Like, sure, you can try to take on everything, but you're not actually that efficient at everything. So yeah. it's best to start outsourcing the things that you're not yeah. that yeah. great yeah. at to people that can do them a little bit more yeah. efficiently and free up your time for the things that you're good at. I think that's one of the way, best ways to be efficient in things. Yeah. So what is, uh, what is your newest book, uh, The Israel Test, about? The Israel Test is, I actually, it's my newest book because I rewrote the introduction, re wrote a new introduction to it mm. after the recent crisis in Israel. Yeah. And Dennis Prager, who's uh, a leading Jewish theorist and journalist and and uh, philosopher and theologian even yeah he he wrote a, a beautiful forward to the new edition but I actually wrote the book in 2004 or mm. something and it's um, was republished in 2008 and nine and now it's being republished again um, and the Israel test, essentially uh, uses Jews and the amazing accomplishments of Jews through history as an um, example of, for capitalism. I mean, we're dependent on the genius of an amazingly small number of people. Hmm. And, and our, our response can be to hail this genius and say, wow, uh, and learn from it and uh, develop your own genius, emulating the genius of the great figures of the past who, who um, have awarded us our bountiful civilization. Or we can resent uh, people who are more successful. And and uh, Jews are 004 percent of the world population, something like that. And uh, they're half the Nobel Prize winners. They're seven out of the top ten richest people on the earth. Uh, they're uh, they've invented all kinds of key things, and. Uh, and, and our response can be to resent this success, believe it was somehow stole from others, hmm. which is a ridiculous idea, but, uh, but it's widely upheld at famous universities that somehow the wealth of the rich was stolen from others. Or we can uh, see the great achievements of Jews and admire them and exalt them and and uh, try to reproduce them ourselves and learn from them and and uh, and thus propagate the civilization that we've inherited and uh, and uh, th this is the Israel test and it's really a capitalist test do you resent people who excel you or do you learn from them and that's the that's the great challenge uh, that um, are being failed so badly in the Middle East and in our colleges today. Somehow we imagine that Israel took something in the Middle East rather than created this amazing country, which now has higher per capita income than Germany. The Japan, uh, Great Britain, or uh, South Korea, and uh, and uh, while fighting five wars and uh, facing uh, Islam that regards them as somehow 
occupiers, though they have, uh, they're only 4% of the land area in the whole Middle East. And mm. somehow at Harvard, they think Israel's too big. It has to give land away the, what it, <laughs> in order to gain peace, um, which is... Uh, but uh, the Israel test tells this history, yeah, and it's an amazing history. I mean, when Israel, when Jews really, uh, the latest generation of Jews are uh, gathered in the Middle East in uh, in the eighteen fifties or so, there were only some two hundred, three hundred thousand Arabs in the whole of what's now called Palestine, hmm. and there are. Average life expectancy was thirty five years years or something, and they had and uh it was a desert yeah. and uh Israel made it bloom and uh and uh failing their Israel test, many of these Arabs in the middle east are uh were some of the most fortunate uh, the Arabs within israel a mil- almost two million in Israel are the richest Arab, big, big group of Arabs in the whole, on the face of the earth. They have, their average life expectancy is 77 years rather than 35 years as it was when the Jews arrived. And so uh, it's, I think Israel is a test and how we respond to it is critical to the future of the United States. Uh, so that's what about so like with uh, everything that's been happening in Israel over the last year or so uh, there's been a focus on uh, the response to October 7th and, and things like that and a lot of people who are very critical of what's going on there are some that are just blatantly anti-Semitic about it and then oh, there, are, there are some people that are just blatantly anti-Semitic in, yeah. in the way that they talk about it. But then there are others who try to separate Israel from uh, the Jewish Jew, Jewish religion and culture. Like, is there is there merit in separating the two at all? You can, but it's, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's to see Israel this country that was created by Jews and really and uh, you know there really were only two or three hundred thousand Bedouins mostly they were mm. most most of them were nomadic mm. uh, as recently as the 1850s and it's it's just the idea that that somehow uh, and now there are millions of Arabs in Israel itself. Yeah. And and they're rich and they're have live uh, seventy seven years on average. You know they're 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 part of this great civilization, and and the idea that somehow Israel is to blame for any of this, the the resentment and hatred that arises from seeing in a culture of shame for seeing other people thrive and succeed is, is absurd. I mean, it, if, if we really tear down all the people who succeed, we'll uh, return to uh, the wilderness of, from which we began as a nomadic group resembling the nomads and Bedouins of the desert in the middle east yeah i'm i'm not an expert on israel at all so i i feel out of my lane speaking about it too much but one of the things that so i'm very skeptical of governments in general and obviously Mm. israel is ran by a government and there i've seen reports or, or journalists claiming this i don't know i can't verify anything people are saying that October 7th was basically allowed by the Israeli government and things like that. Like Egypt was trying to warn. I mean, 
I mean, we have crimes every day yeah. committed all across the United States. Do, yeah. Yeah, do our governments permit it? This was essentially just a, a, a vicious attack mm. that uh, had been cleverly planned for quite a long time. And they used drones, which were invented by Israelis, and, <laughs> and uh, to to accomplish their effects. Okay. Uh, but but this this is just one of seven wars that that the jihadists have perpetrated over the years, um, which derive from this same culture of shame and resentment toward the successes of others. And if you really feel shame and resentment toward the successes of others, you're not a civilized being. You're a, you're a representative of the wilderness, and mm. and it's you're part of a sent, satanic sent temptation. And uh, I just uh, you know they can stop the war anytime they want. They just have to uh, recognize that they lost, and they. Uh, and that it was an evil plan to begin with. It's yeah. I don't. I, I don't think there's any doubt that Hamas is evil. I think what really what challenges people, and what I think a lot of people struggle with, is all the casualties. And I, I know fewer casualty casualties than most wars. I yeah. mean, it's. It's uh, there. There are wars yeah. have casualties, and if if and Hamas actually, its whole plan is to generate civilian casualties. Mm. That's it, and so it's it's and um, Israel's plan is try to, to stop the civilian casualties by constantly leafleting and communicating uh, to the civilians to get out of the way and that yeah. and uh, and um deliver up the arms uh you know it's uh it's it it's a tra it is a tragic predicament yeah. but uh, but it's not a novelty and it doesn't have anything to do with occupation or any of those things uh the you know if 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 you want a two-state solution, we've had that from the beginning. Jordan is juxtaposed with Israel, and uh, it uh, it has one tenth the population density. Mm. It has the same kind of agricultural resources, the same Jordan River, the same uh, geology, and it. It uh, could easily accommodate the Palestinians, but the Palestinians don't want to live. They want to fight. They want to mm -hmm. kill Jews. And as long as that's their motivation, and it's they're probably uh, they're going to face a superior civilization uh, attacking them, and. And uh, it's a, uh, it is it's a tragic predicament, but uh, the miracle of Israel and and the su success of Israel's armaments are is is um, is amazing, and I was one of the figures who um, told. President Reagan about the possibility of a strategic defense initiative way back. I met with Reagan in 1985 and I showed him his first microchip. I gave him a hmm. DRAM memory chip from Micron Technology in Idaho. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I discussed it with him and told him how these kinds of chips would enable uh, a strategic defense initiative that could intercept missiles um, before they 
wreak their effects. And and uh, Reagan, I was one of the people who proposed this to him, and Reagan uh, was very fascinated by the microchip, and we discussed it for uh, extensively. Hmm. And... And he, but, and the U.S. did make an effort to do a, a strategic defense initiative, and we we did accomplish some something. Raytheon and Boeing and some of these companies did make contributions, but really Israel was the country that actually did it. Mm. They created the Iron Dome and David Sling. And the Arrow 3 system that w- did the first space interception of missiles from mm. uh, Iran recently. And uh, they really created this strategic defense initiative. And the U.S. now uh, has a, a, a compact with Israel in the development of these systems. and. Uh, and that's uh, and so Israel protects us as mm. well as as us helping them. I mean, we're really of uh, companies like Intel or Google or really are are Intel is almost entirely a, an Israeli company. It's our leading microchip company, and it's yeah. it's most sophisticated. Wafer Fab is in Kirat Gat, and and uh, its first revenues came from non-volatile memories invented by Dov Froman, who was an Israeli who was one of the early people at Intel, and and Google has, and IBM and Facebook all have crucial uh, facilities in Israel. Yeah. And our economy is is symbiotic with the Israeli economy, and uh, this is our Israel test, as I mm. explain in the book. As a, and and I I'm not Israeli or Jewish, but I I I recognize that uh, capitalism depends on the genius of a few people who contribute major inventions and insights that um, render our civilization possible and prosperous. Yeah, I I agree with that. I I think it it seems like a very, you you said the, the solution is to stop attacking, but is it a, real solution there. Like, I I think what's happening with the colleges in the U.S. is maybe a different problem, but with the people actually in Israel, the Palestinians, my understanding is that Hamas, the, the leadership isn't even usually there. They're like in Kuwait or something like that. So if you have a, a group that is hostile to Israel, controlling things from outside of the area that Israel can really retaliate and they keep getting people obviously the more power the more civilians that die the more outcry can be created by the uh by Hamas for the Palestinians and the more outrage that can be created is do you think there's like any possible like realistic end in sight for what's going on uh, Israel I think uh the but ben, uh, Netanyahu's vision for which I explain in the Israel test, I, I give his entire history, and and he has a long history. Mm. Um, he could be American. He's got six cousins in the steel industry in wow. Pennsylvania. I mean, mm. he's and um, but uh, Netanyahu's vision is ultimately that. All civilization depends on uh, not attacking uh, your superiors, and and this is um, and that is uh, 
the jihadists have to learn that lesson. If if you really believe that the people who, who uh, envy and hate success are going to prevail in the world, there really isn't any hope for humanity. Yeah. Uh, we got to believe that ultimately people who are creative and who are contributing to our prosperity and wealth and progress uh, will prevail over people who are trying to tear it down and dismantle it and attack it. And, and uh, that's, that's the, and I, I believe we have, uh, we have something of a China test. At the same time, I mean, China now has four or five times as many engineers as we do. They're in many ways they're more capitalists than we are today. Yeah. Um, there are uh, huge amounts of venture capital and huge numbers of new businesses and huge manufacturing capabilities and um, electronic advances and and uh and for the US to try to stop China today from uh ultimately absorbing Taiwan is uh is both futile and extremely dangerous and it's it's, it's like if China decided to take over Puerto Rico and uh or even Florida you know that it's uh it's it's really an amazingly provocative policy that the U.S. is following, and uh, it's China is twenty times more powerful than it was when we first, with Nixon and Kissinger, agreed that Taiwan was part of China and America would recognize that. And here, twenty China is twenty times more powerful, has nuclear weapons and all kinds of capabilities. And today, we we think we can stop Taiwanese companies from trading with China. I mean, it's we really have we're we are not in the right. I don't believe mm. in the, in this conflict over Taiwan. We're deliberately probing and and uh, antagonizing China and prompting China to ally with Iran and Russia. And it, yeah. it's really, this is a, a China test we face. And we got to understand that China is going to be a factor in the world and that uh, the Communist Party in China is not, is not a commendable final solution to anything, but it's, mm. it's trying to deal with a capitalist world and it's, and it's not, um, uh, devoted to climate change, uh, religion or, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually more positive in it's economic role in many ways than the U S is at the moment. So this is, this is a, a challenge a test yeah. that we face in the future. Well, yeah, China has, it's one of the big flaws with uh, the climate ideology or whatever yeah. you want to call it, because people say we need to stop fossil fuel use, but China is massive. They have a bigger population. I mean, their population is over a billion and we have a population in the U S of around 400 million. And all of these packs and things that we're doing are not, we're not influencing China. And mm -hmm. I've, I've heard people try to say, well, we'll, we stop and then we'll influence China. And that is not at all. Uh -huh. They're just going to take competitive advantage and run with it. Mm -hmm. And how it just seems like the fatal flaw with the, the climate agenda in, in that if you, if everyone's not on board, it, let's say, let's say the climate everything is real and the outrage is warranted. Well, if you don't have everyone on board, it doesn't matter anyway, because whatever we reduce is going to be negated by yeah, what China yeah. produces. And I, I think, I, I mean, I, I just don't, I know that this is 
the usual thing to say, let's assume. Why assume something that's absurd and uh, that the carbon dioxide we're all emitting right at the moment and all our plants depend upon and yeah. and that uh, are somehow a fatal menace to the race is, is just, is is a bizarre f- mistake mm-hmm. of science that uh, Al Gore adopted for the Democratic Party f- twenty years ago now or something. Yeah, and and it was wrong and an inconvenient truth that uh, inconvenient truth was full of mendacious claims or false claims, and and it's wrong today and. And and uh, I don't think it the the Trump approach, which has been to say, you know, maybe it's right, but Chinese won't do it, and mm. and we're and uh, our burden is too gri- too large, and you know, it's, it's pretending that it's a bad deal rather than. Uh, a bad idea from the beginning yeah. is uh, is is I think a mistake. I think uh, the and I I think in Germany and in Europe they're discovering it. They just discovered that that the uh, so-called alternative uh, windmills and solar panels just don't produce power. So yeah. so they're in Europe they're really abandoning it. They're you know this convulsion in their politics all over Europe and yeah. as a result of the bad effects of their climate change policies and we all the west has got to come face up to the value of fossil fuels and 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 they will evolve as mm-hmm. time passes the sources of as throughout history we've actually used less carbon in our mm-hmm. energy systems than in the past yeah. and and that will probably continue but not if we say today we're going to declare an emergency we're going to abandon uh, profit and loss and we're going to abandon uh, the marketplace and instead impose uh, some new energy regime mm. that uh, is far inferior to the efficiency of of um, extracting petroleum from the ground out of a 14-inch hole yeah. uh, rather than spreading windmills across uh, the, millions of acres around the world. Yeah. It's, it's it's just a mistake, and uh, and we've got to move on. That's a that's our our test of capitalism to have real capitalism rather than emergency socialism, which is what we're experiencing today. Yeah, I've heard. I believe Jordan Peterson articulate this once that one of the big problems that he has with the climate agenda is it seems to be let's let a bunch of poor people, let's kill off a bunch of poor people in the world right now so that some hypothetical future people can live a better life later. And I I think he articulated that really well. And I think it's a big problem because that seems to be like, it seems very privileged of us to say, well, we've gotten where we need to be. So let's, let's stop the whole world from being able to get where we are. And it, it just seems like, yeah, it it just seems horrible that we would want to keep everyone else in poverty. Plus there's tons of evidence to show that as, as people escape poverty like when you're when you're living in poverty when a country is in like at a poverty level 
they they don't feel any concern for the environment. But as pe- as nations grow yeah. more efficient and they they gain wealth, then they start to take more action as far as making the world better and, and worrying about the yeah. environment. Yeah. So it seems like there's pretty big problems with the climate well, agenda. My, uh, my new new book, which uh, is heavily about graphene, which is a single two-dimensional layer of mm. carbon atoms that's 200 times stronger than steel and yeah. a thousand times more conductive than copper and that switches in the terahertz, trillions of cycles a second rather than the gigahertz like our silicon chips. And that is um, as flexible as rubber and and uh, and just can be a transformative new technology. Yeah. This um, a graphene can be produced by uh, converting plastic waste. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge island of plastic mm. waste in the Pacific that yeah. can be converted directly into graphene mm. uh, uh, garbage or the garbage we produce. The uh, uh, human waste can be converted into graphene. Yeah. Uh, the whole idea that the future is somehow overshadowed with all these catastrophes. These catastrophes will be realized only if we fail to pursue the promise of freedom. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, we celebrated Freedom Fest and other, but freedom is essential. Yeah. But freedom also requires structure. Mm. You, you need a low entropy carrier that is a predictable carrier to bear high entropy, unexpected, unpredictable messages of creativity. And that's the real theme of the life after capitalism, which is yeah. the, uh, where I have a chapter on graphene yeah. and, and it's great promise. And, and, uh, and that promise is becoming increasingly evident to the world as five Nobel Prizes and yeah. thousands and thousands of companies all over the world have emerged to pursue this new graphene mm-hmm. material that... that uh, it was only discovered in what, 2012, was it? 2004. 2004 the Nobel okay. Prize for it was 2010. Okay. And uh, But the real... It's graphene is a single layer of graphite, which Mm -hmm. is in your pencils. We talked about the pencil earlier. It was uh, discovered that uh, this single layer that of graphite Mm. that everybody had imagined would would just break in pieces as so it's stronger as. An individual layer, because, I mean, people have broken pencils. You could break a pencil with your thumb pushing yeah, on but it, Yeah, right? but the pencil is has uh, millions, billions of layers yeah. of graphene comprise a single lump of graphite. And Got graphite right. is, is the rock form of carbon mm. that is extracted from mines. Yeah. But um, but graphene is a single layer, two dimensional layer of ca- carbon atoms in a lump of graphite, mm. and the reason and uh, these each layer of graphene that comprises the graphite is connected to other layers by something called van der Waals forces. Mm. Van der Waals, which are very uh, weak molecular attractive forces, yeah. and and it and uh, people assume that that the graphene layers would just break apart as they do when you write. Yeah. But the fact is, if you actually create one of these graphene sheets, it's 
tensile strength is 200 times greater than steel. Hmm. And it has all this conductive capability. And it's, it's uh, such a perfect material, perfect carbon, natural carbon form, allotrope is a form of carbon that it um, that you inject it into a broken spinal cord and the and the signals in the spinal cord are conveyed so accurately that that the cord refuses you can find it on youtube where a mouse uh has its spinal cord cut and uh it's refused with graphene and the mouse is back on in the trampoline um in the later image so Mm -hmm. Uh, there are all kinds of thrilling developments out there in technology, and some of them are AI. Artificial intelligence is a wonderful new interface yeah. interface with uh, computer resources, and mm-hmm. it's 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 not a bad thing. It's a better interface, and we'll all be using it, and it'll be valuable but it doesn't displace our minds or create a singularity that will dominate the universe all that is just hokum from experts and we get a lot of hokum from experts under the regime of emergency socialism that i criticize in uh, life after capitalism yeah it seems like a lot of things that you promote and a lot of things that you believe are kind of revolve around this idea that the more government intervention, like emergency socialism, Mm -hmm. the more you try to control things with a climate agenda, the more you try to uh, bail out companies and and keep them afloat, even though they're they're, they should be failing Mm -hmm. because I mean, all the bailouts and stuff, I think like Chrysler, GM, whatever, they should have just let it fail and yeah. somebody could have bought it on pennies on the dollar and innovated and made yeah, it into yeah, something yeah. better. It seems like all of these interventions and centralized kind of trying to control the outcome, You and I would agree with you, you, you seem to be against that and let, let the decentralized aspect yeah. just create and, yeah. and innovate and, and become what it is going to yeah, become. Yeah, yeah. And so... We're decentralized minds. We're um, and they're eight billion. Yeah, and uh, we should let them prosper and create yeah. in the image of their creator. Mm. Yeah. Well, George, it has been amazing talking to you. Before we wrap up, I wanna. Uh, I always love to ask people about books, so feel free to recommend any of your books. But any other books that you recommend? I know you. You'll in the books that I've read of yours, you will mention a bunch of other authors. So feel free to mention any books that have been influential in your life, including your own, if you'd like. Um, yeah, I, I love to hear about books. Well, that... super abundance. Mm-hmm. You should interview uh, uh, Gail Pooley or Marion Tupi. Okay. Uh, they're, they wrote super abundance, which shows that measured by time prices, um, technological progress has been thousands of times greater than is measured by the usual monetary gauges. So that uh, time price is the amount of time a typical worker has to spend to uh, gain the money to buy the goods and services that sustain his life. And by that measure, which can apply to ancient times, uh, countries around the world, it's, it's a universal measure of minutes and seconds that, um, and hours that, that really do give us, uh, a standard to estimate value Hmm. and it's a real standard and it's universal and it shows a wonderful upside surprise that 
that the world is much more prosperous and has made much more progress than uh, the economists have imagined. Mm. And and um, Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize, Yale economist won the Nobel Prize in part for his time price concept. And, and it can, and, but he didn't extend it to all the other economic applications in superabundance, which is this uh, book published last year was the book of the year at Freedom Fest this year. And yeah. it gives you a whole new vision of the world economy. Yeah, awesome. I wrote an introduction to it that'll t tell you the essence of life after capitalism. Mm. So, awesome. Well, George, it's been amazing talking to you. Uh, before we wrap up, will you give listeners a way to find you, uh, where to find your books, and anything else you'd like to share? Well, uh, on, uh, my books are all on Amazon and all on Kindle, and all can be, almost all of them, I think, are maybe Visible Man was an early book uh, that's not available. But Men and Marriage came out again this year, and and a Canon Press hmm. in uh, um, Idaho, wonderful press, produced uh, both Men and Marriage and a, the story of my intellectual life called The Sage Against the Machine. And hmm. so that's... that's um, an early book that's that's come out again, and uh, I write a news investment newsletters. The Gilder Technology Gilder's Technology Report, mm. and uh, and uh, Gilder's Moonshots and Gilder's Guidepost, and you can look up those. You just go on uh, Google and you can find these the sites for Gilder's technology report, which will tell you about life after NVIDIA, how uh, we're get moving beyond chips now. Yeah. And so there are lots of exciting opportunities in graphene, which allows you to transcend cutting all these silicon wafers into millions of little chips. Instead, you can have wafer scale integration and uh, Gilder Technology Report and Gilder's Moonshots tell the story. Awesome. Well, George, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And Eagle Publishing is the, does this. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Great. Thank you. It was mindlessly thoughtful, <laughs> thoughtfully. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on X at RDTM Podcast and Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless. <laughs>